So um, I'd like to introduce our panel, um, Heather Hargreaves, uh, Ann Wagner uh, from MAPS, um, Mark Hayden, and Trevor Miller. So we're going to... Uh, We're going to start with, uh, a dis uh, I guess if each one will, uh, each participant will have a, a few minutes to say uh, something about the future of psychedelic science. We'll have a discussion and then we'll uh, take, our question take your questions. Okay, the future of psychedelic science. So myself, I try and move my psychedelic causes forward on a few different paths, which I just spoke about. So the first one is the, the MAPS research way, phase one, phase two, phase three, clinical trials, the medical model, a wonderful way to get these medicines into the mainstream. That's one of my paths. The other path is this special access drug program that I'm using with Health Canada. There's a chance, you know, if, if I do get permission with this medicine, there's a chance we can get permission with other medicines if we get creative. So that's another path. And then the other path, which I think is, uh, I don't know, it kind of makes all the other paths move. But we could just get rid of prohibition. Prohibition has never worked. It's not working now. People are dying like crazy, 11 people a day in Canada from the opioid crisis, the last thing I heard. So the other path I walk, which I think is very kind of at the core of the future of psychedelics, is prohibition isn't working. And I think we should all be as vocal as we possibly can be about that and get educated on why it isn't working. And go on YouTube and find Mark Hayden's talk on prohibition and it's just, you just bang your head against the wall on what a bad idea prohibition is. And it, it, it is, you know, for psychedelics as well, we would just have so much more flexibility to work with these, the least harmful class of drugs if we could just get over that prohibition hump. So, um, yeah, future psychedelic science I think is very bright for many different reasons, and prohibition sucks. <laughs> so I'd like to just play with one idea here, and this is really how psychedelics, how psychedelics <laughs> should be regulated in the future. I mentioned in my previous talk that I had read this paper that had a lot to say about psychedelic supervision and how to be certified and how to be licensed as a psychedelic supervisor, but the piece that was the most difficult to write in the paper was youth access. So we really went back and forth. There's a little paragraph in the paper, it's not very long, but we went back and forth and rewrote that many times. So in order to make a statement about how youth should be able to access psychedelic experiences in a post-prohibition world, we started by looking at Aboriginal groups. And so we said, what do indigenous communities that have been using these things for years do? And what we found is that it was inconsistent. There are ayahuasca communities where pregnant women show up, women with toddlers show up, women with babies show up, and they grow up in that tradition. There is no age separation at any point. There's also the peyote folks who do celebrate transitions, and so things like puberty. So that's the point when the young adult um, is, emerges into the experience and gets celebrated in their adulthood through this process. So that was, that was one piece we went looked at. We went looked at another one, which was, in the United States, how do adults allow youth to drink alcohol, specifically around the, the family dining room table? And we found something like 21 states that allow, legally, an adult to supervise a youth in their consumption of a drug, which is alcohol, so long as it's within the context of the family. We thought that was interesting. We then ask the question, how do, how do youth access, this is a health process. So if we're looking at it through the lens of health, how do youth access health services? And there's a, some language in the Provincial Health Act that, said, that talks about a mature minor. So what's a mature minor? A mature minor is not defined by age. 
It's defined by do they understand what they're asking for. And so if a young girl, let's say 15, walks into her doctor's office and says, I would like to be on the birth control pill, the doctor can say yes. And she's not legally an adult, but then the doctor does not have to inform the parent that this medical service was offered. And that's written in legislation. And so we then said, how do we put all that together? And so what we said is, yes, youth should be able to access the psychedelic experience. It is ideal if they do it with their parents. So if they can persuade their parents to show up with them, doing it within the family context is perfect. But if they don't want to have access with their parent, they should be allowed to have access if they are mature enough to understand what they're asking for, if they have the experience within the context of a, an adult who has been licensed and has a youth specialty. That was our eventual conclusion, and it took us a long time to get there. Thank you. So I'm Ann Wagner. For those of you who were at Heather's talk, um, we were split um, on the same time slot. So I'm a clinical psychologist and researcher, and I'm one of the investigators for the MAPS funded study of uh, cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy for PTSD, as well as cognitive processing therapy for PTSD. And I'm from here in Toronto. So I just made this up on the spot of what I think the future psychedelics is about, but I think there's two D's. For me, they are data and diversity are the two things that are the future psychedelics. So number one, data, um, because I think we're at a time of real opportunity and we have to be very careful with that opportunity. Um, as we see doors opening, the ability to do these studies, to answer these very important questions, to um, help and heal so many people, we have to be very, very conscious of doing that in a good way and doing that with accurate and, and meticulous data. And because there's such a risk of if we don't do it well, that door may close. So I think um, that, number one, is we need to do this with a lot of um, thoughtfulness and foresight. Uh, so that's one. And then the other is diversity. And I touched on this a little bit, um, that we're, we're moving away a, a little bit. We're, keep, we're hoping to keep the best pieces of our psychedelic history and lineage and move into uh, things that really welcome and embrace the diversity of our different communities, including, for example, not having male-female therapist dyads, including more people of color in the work we're doing and as leaders within this world um, to encourage folks who are women to lead the studies and not just be the co-therapists within them. Um, so I really think those things are things I really care about and um, we'll see the future of psychedelic science. Thanks. Hello, my name is Heather Hargraves, and likewise for those who are at Anstock, uh, I am a neurofeedback therapist, and I primarily work with developmental trauma and head injuries. Um, and for me as a neurofeedback therapist who developed a neurofeedback protocol during my master's research that mimics a psychedelic state, so I use the data from psychedelic findings to kind of induce the afterglow or kind of approximate the afterglow state of a psychedelic made me really interested in the preparation and integration phases of psychedelic therapy and also in looking inward a little bit more while also looking outward to our ancestors and the traditional lineages around us that kind of preceded all of this work and not to be using these substances just as escapes um, that we want to value where they're coming from and that potentially if we can work on better methods for preparation and integration, it might be that not everyone needs to take ayahuasca every weekend and worry about growing these plants. And there could also be, um, when I was talking with some shaman, they were telling me that some of the retreats, they have individuals coming from war-torn countries and the shamans find it really difficult to work with these individuals because the trauma is so heavy. 
So could we use some of the technology that we have to help slowly integrate people who are really far dysregulated, even further than sometimes talk therapy can do because they don't have access to their cognitive minds to kind of help prepare them and then also use these technologies to help them integrate the change or the mystical experience that they've had. Because I'm sure everyone's had the experience where you have a shift, but then you go back into your world and how do you maintain that? And part of it too is that I think attention is one of our greatest commodities and right now our attention is being bought and sold by the media, bought and sold by the technology we use, and we've kind of lost touch with our own ability to look inward and can we kind of shift the mirror around and use these technologies more for self-reflective practices so that all of the work that everyone's doing with psychedelics can have a, a deeper grounding and more integrative and supportive kind of community feel to also bring back some of the traditional ways that we worked with them before. If that made sense. <laughs>psychedelic renaissance appears to be moving faster and faster uh, but over the last almost 70 years most of the research is focused on psychiatric kind of issues PTSD addiction depression anxiety where do you see psychedelic research going say in the next 10 20 years do you want to start with that mark sure I'd love to so I, I think right now the low-hanging fruit is being attractive to researchers, like the mood disorders, tobacco cessation, alcohol um, issues. The stuff that's being researched today is the easy stuff, I think. Um, working our way up the tree, um, I look at things like personality disorders. Now, if you think about the psychiatric view of the world, there are things that are treatable and there are things that are not treatable. And generally speaking, mood disorders fit into I said, what is it? No, personality disorders fit into the not treatable category. And yet there's some indication, some little clues that psychedelics could be helpful for personality disorders. Um, specifically, there was a piece of research that said the domain of openness, which is generally seen as inflexible, seems to be responsive to psychedelics. So that's an interesting one to play with. Um, I'm really interested. I, I know someone who believes that he has schizophrenia and that he's managing his symptoms with microdosing, microdosing LSD and psilocybin. So I've gone into the literature trying to find examples that uh, support what I'm seeing with this one individual. And there are some examples that are incredibly rare, but I've dug them out of the literature. So there's, there's a little something in there that perhaps the symptoms of schizophrenia could be helped, perhaps is the key word here, um, with very, very small dosages of LSD or psilocybin. I'm also interested in expanding, you know, LSD, 3-MMC, dimethyltryptamine, 5-MeO-DMT, um, I think a range of different psychedelics and trying to understand what they offer um, for different conditions, because we really are focusing our research right now on psilocybin or MDMA, and we need to expand that significantly. Uh, so I think one thing that, I mean, part of the big reason why we focus on uh, diagnosable disorders is because that tends to be the route by which things will become uh, legalized, right? So that's, it's the, the doorway, the entry point into use that is not uh, illegal anymore. And I think one thing that we can do with that is we can also be answering other questions along the road while we are still focusing on that as our main outcome. So if we think, for example, of you know, the work I'm doing treating PTSD, we also measure a whole host of other things at the same time. And so you can see, and you hopefully will be able to see gains in different areas. So we're starting to develop um, a bigger realm of research and bigger, you know, different things that we can see changing. And one of the biggest things in my work is that we are treating the relationship as well between two people. And so we're actually dosing someone who does not have necessarily a diagnosable disorder of any type. So that's, that to me is an entry point into looking like, hey, we successfully, um, and not just successfully, like it was feasible, it was safe with good outcome, dosed people who were not, you know, didn't have PTSD. So I think there's 
ways in which we can absolutely create a lot of data and a lot of information to help push this forward by being thoughtful about what we integrate into the protocols that we're doing right now. Um, I like I like the idea that we'll hopefully eventually be able to get more research and do more studies on quote unquote healthy normals. And you know, I think Thoreau said most men lead lives of quiet desperation. And unfortunately, I think our healthy normals are all suffering a little bit too. So I like the. Uh, you know, the promise of being able to take medicines like this and studying what they can do for, you know, a relatively high-functioning person and see what, I, I love the, the Johns Hopkins study that uh, Mark shared this morning about facilitating mystical experiences. I think opening up these spiritual realms for people, which, as I said in my presentation, I think that's ultimately where the, where the gift of life is, is once you're upon that path, and I, I think these are ultimately spiritual tools that, you know, we can help make the, make the whole world a bit better place. And then you can do, you know, I, I once put myself through a protocol. I had heard James Jesso speak at an event in Vancouver, and he talked about how he took mushrooms once a month for 13 months. And at the same conference, I heard a woman speak about, she was an ayahuasca, and she was speaking about how sometimes the medicine gives you very practical advice. And the, the example she used is somebody came to the medicine and uh, said, I have, really, I have really cold feet. So what can I do about my cold feet? And the medicine said, put on your socks. <laughs> so, so, you know, and then if you've experimented or you know been to medicine ceremonies before and maybe you've been given advice like put on your socks and you go in to the next session and you have to put on your socks and that's when you get kind of punished. So <laughs> I took those two stories together and put together what I called my hyper evolution protocol, which was I had a bunch of good LSD, this was a few years ago, and I specifically had some blockages in my life and I wanted to move forward my life. So I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take LSD once a week for a month, but I will only take it the next week if I've managed to put on my socks in the meantime. So the first time I took it, all this stuff came up around my wife and ex-wife and she, she was moving back into the house and, Kind of, it was this horrible trip actually, and showed me how bad it could get. But then at the end of the trip, it was like, kind of like, okay, so make it better, prepare for her. So I immediately did that. I cleared out closet space. We, I did a bunch of things and put myself at peace. So the next week, I took medicine again, and the next week, I got kind of a real laundry list of things that were obviously bothering me unconsciously that I hadn't been dealing with them. So the day before the next week's session, I just banged off a whole bunch of things on this laundry list so I could do medicine again. So, you know, by the third and fourth sessions, I went straight into these heavenly realms, and I really did feel as though my life moved ahead a lot because of that protocol. So, you know, studying things like that, there's so many cool research projects that could do. I, I tell Mark we should bat around, you know, put together this wish list of all the research we could possibly do in the future and try and get studies funded from there. <laughs> I think I'm really interested in, like, destigmatizing mental health. And I also think that uh, a recent talk that I was at uh, the Neurofeedback Conference, one of the researchers had gone back and looked at the developmental trajectory of children, and then he categorized it by when certain uh, areas of the brain were developing and what kind of trauma they had been exposed to. So whether it had been neglect, whether it had been sexual abuse, whether it had been physical abuse of a different form, or whether it had been verbal abuse. And not that you can completely <clears throat> pull that all apart, but he found that when certain brain areas were traumatized by a certain type of abuse, they correlate with different mental health disorders later in life. And so while I understand it's really important for these categorical um, mental health categories <laughs> to exist, <laughs> sorry. It's exciting but nerve wracking to be up here, guys. <laughs> um, and that's important for funding within our certain models that we have right now. It's also understanding that 
that's something that you know happened to you that could also be part of a spiritual process that you can emerge from and that you do not need to be labeled for the rest of your life because of that and i love the beauty of psychedelics to help someone open up and to move past that but i think because i'm the, the tech girl up here i'm really fascinated by how all these fmri studies and what we're learning from psychedelics is teaching us about different regions of the brain and how when the dysregulation in this region of the brain, if that filter is kind of sideways, it can lead to this kind of reflection, which is reflected in this mental health diagnosis. And you can reverse engineer that, and then you can kind of reverse engineer your life. And then you can just understand your process and kind of your karmic path or whatever that may be. And then you can embrace it and move forward with it. And I'm so fascinated with post-traumatic growth um, one of the things I really feel is that individuals who've had this trauma and have had their worlds shattered, they're not stuck as much. Even though they're kind of stuck inside, if they learn to kind of move forward and to embrace that challenge, there can be such a beautiful opening that can come from that. So the de-stigmatization, de de that, not even try. <laughs> you know what I mean. And also <laughs> kind of moving towards this growth perspective is something that I find psychedelic science really inspires and is making me feel really excited about because I think what you believe is so powerful and some of our diagnostic sy systems right now are actually quite oppressive for those who are stuck within them even though they're very productive for getting them the care they need. It's like a two-way street. <laughs> Do you have any uh, uh, comments on any, anything you've said? Um, we have uh, several questions from uh, many of you who are interested in what you can do to become a psychedelic counselor, guide, supervisor. I get asked that question all the time. And I don't have an answer. I mean, some people say the vehicle is psychiatry, some people say the vehicle is psychology, some people say the vehicle is social work. That would be me. Um, bias. But the truth of the matter is we don't know. I mean, what's going to happen is that we will present our data, our phase three clinical data, to the federal government to say, now you agree, you've had oversight of the whole process, and so now MDMA for assisted psychotherapy, PTSD, is about to become legal. What do you want to do with that? Now, we don't know what we're going to get back. And there are really quite a few options. You know, they could say, well, it's a medicine, it's physicians, you it's available in prescription. OK, but that doesn't quite work. You know, maybe they'll say it's psychiatry, but then actually that doesn't really work well either. So that's the advocation of this new profession. But will the federal government support that and say that's the way it's supposed to go? We don't know. But I certainly get, um, I get asked that question a lot. And what I offer is my bias. And my bias is the first word in the organization that I'm part of, which is multidisciplinary. I also get asked this question a lot. Um, and I think I, this will be my non-data, non-science perspective. Uh, there's a lot of synchronicities that landed me where I am. And if, when I really reflect on it, and I think about you know the, the lucky few of us at the moment who can call themselves psychedelic and pathogen-assisted psychotherapists, um, the commonality of the people who are there is that everyone is expert. And expert does not mean that you have to be an expert in psychiatry or an expert in psychology. It means they're an expert in something, and they're an expert in enough of their own experience. And I think that's extremely important. Like, like what Trevor said, like you've got to do your own work within like to know yourself well, especially in this kind of burgeoning area. And I really think that's important. Um, and doing your own work means a lot of different things. It doesn't necessarily mean psychedelic work, it just means knowing yourself. And and it's a, you know, not always a smooth road in this area. So to know that you're gonna come up to, against obstacles and of waiting and you know the health Canada protocols and you know there's there's going to be like lots of hurdles on the way and so the more comfortable you are with just facing 
darkness and, and slowness and not knowing when things are going to happen, uncertainty, that's very important. And I also really want to emphasize that we don't just need therapists. We need all professions. We need, we need accountants. We need lawyers. Oh my gosh, we need lawyers. We need, <laughs> um, you know, we need people who are going to help us get money. We need um, literally anything you can think of. If you are an expert in that, you can contribute to this movement. So it's, um, and I, I want to emphasize that because not everyone will be, will be therapists. Just not everyone's, that's not necessarily their interest or skill set, and that's not the only way in. Um, so self knowledge, expert. That's what I think. Um, you could start by volunteering for maps. <laughs> <laughs> and. We are, we have a great kind of volunteer network and community in Vancouver, but we're going to make a very uh, concerted effort to expand our volunteer base. I've been speaking to Bradley since I've been here about dovetailing into the Toronto Psychedelic Society and doing some events that way. So we're really trying to make MAPS volunteer base a lot more national. Um, I think specifically about psychedelic psychotherapy, it wasn't the route that I took, you know, the route that I took, it was almost like I helped a, a segment of society that not that many people were keen on helping, and I got kind of trial by fire in 200 Ibogaine sessions that way, and kind of developed a therapeutic way of being with people through that. But I would recommend that you, you get trained in some kind of counseling or, you know, even registered massage therapist or something where you learn about medical confidentiality, where you know how to hold yourself professionally with a client. You, you know, I think if you want to work in this field, you've got to really try and evolve beyond all those second chakra issues that seem to come up for people in this work at a certain point. So, you know, really work on yourself. And then, um, I've only speaking, spoken in front of audiences, I think three or four times around my work with psychedelics, but the second time I did that was at the Psychedelic Psychotherapy Forum in uh, Victoria, which is coming up again in October. But I, I spoke at it the first year, I spoke about it, uh, Ibogaine. The second year, I was invited to speak again, and I said to Kevin, the guy arranging it, I'm like, well, what do you want me to talk about? You know, I've, I've talked about Ibogaine. I said, let me think about it for a couple of days. And I came back to him and I said, well, why don't I talk about psychedelic entrepreneurship? Mm -hmm. And he said, great idea, talk about that. So then I started sweating. <laughs> <laughs> what did I just do? Am I, did I just sign up to teach people how to give illicit drugs to people? There might be an RCMP in the audience that day. So the workaround, which is a beautiful workaround, I think, and a way I've kind of lived since I had an idea, is, you know, psychedelic means mind, or if you look in the Oxford Dictionary, uh, soul actually comes first before mind for psyche, and then delos is to make manifest. So, Soul manifesting and entrepreneurship is undertaking a business or venture. So I look at psychedelic entrepreneurship as manifesting your soul into a business or enterprise, which I think is what I've done with Liberty Root. And I did this presentation on psychedelic entrepreneurship in Victoria. In rewatching it, it's so dense. I tried to pack in so much information into 40 minutes, but at the same time, I think I laid a pretty cool patterning on how to, you know, if you feel in your heart that you want to work with something like this but don't know the direction you want to take, I think I put a lot of tidbits in that psychedelic entrepreneurship talk that you can find on YouTube if you felt so inclined. So imagine a world where psychedelics are legal. What kind of institutions or um, uh, opportunities would exist for um, people to interact with psychedelics. I would love to open a psychedelic neurofeedback clinic. <laughs> I think that would be really interesting. And so we could map the brain. And right now I'm, I haven't had a chance, but I came across the research that came out where they had found that uh, individuals' sound of their voice or their cadence is one way, uh, comparing it with some of their qualitative measures and quantitative measures, 
of indicating whether or not they're going to have a mystical experience with psilocybin. And that fascinates me to no end because I feel a voice is just the emergent property of your resonance. And with neurofeedback, I'm studying your resonance, right? It's, my supervisor said that consciousness is the interface between, it's a field generated event. So it's the different parts of your body resonating. And then it's the field of that cross resonance is where your consciousness exists. And so with neurofeedback, we're playing with the resonance frequencies. So I would love to see maps of people's brains and see what's going on in their brain. Why are they more likely to have this mystical experience? And then can we reverse engineer that and support that? So that would be one way. And another way, I think, because working with trauma, I think body work is really important. And having psychedelic informed body workers, bringing people into their physical state. And then once they're kind of connected there, hopefully, because some individuals really struggle getting into their thinking mind, then you could bring on like CBT if they've been struggling to get into a cognitive headspace before, because you kind of built them from the bottom up, and then you can work from the top down. Uh, so, this is something I think about a lot, um, <laughs> of what it may look like one day, and um, something I didn't talk about in my talk, but also kind of in the realm of psychedelic entrepreneurship, I actually this week opened a um, mental health innovation community here in Toronto called Remedy. <laughs> and, uh, and the goal of it is a social enterprise. So the idea is all the profit we make from practice gets reinvested back into mental health innovation. And that will be, you know, right now that's funding uh, are going to be contributing to funding MDMA assisted psychotherapy studies. But down the road, my hope is also that we'll have enough that that would also support, when this becomes legalized, um, be able to support bringing people through treatment who cannot otherwise afford to do it. And also that like once that door is open and we can go kind of off label a little bit, hopefully, uh, you know, we'll have the ability to also pursue that as a, a means of growth and exploration as well. And so my hope is that by, if you build it, they will come or approve, I don't know, whatever, one of those things. So my hope is that by laying the foundation for it, that that will manifest it. So that's my hope of what it would look like. And so like the dual purpose of both healing, but also growth. Um, and what's so important about that is set setting in context and support and integration, which I believe in very firmly in all of those ways. Um, so I think those would be really important elements. What would happen if some of the religious traditions that are floating around North America that are openly destitute in terms of spiritual experiences <laughs> incorporated <laughs> the psychedelic experience into <laughs> That's just a question. <laughs> so, what would happen? What would happen if couples had more access to psychedelic experiences together? Yes. Now, that's an interesting one to play with because there are some psychedelics out there, and DMA for example, but help couples by increasing the bond of love between them, which is quite wonderful. There are other psychedelics out there that are slightly better for problem solving, things like 3-methamethcathinone, 3-MMC. It's a bit more talk-ish and a little less love-ish, but it's certainly a lot of revelation that goes along with that. So for a couple's helping, I'm not gonna use the word therapy, but for helping couples to bond, um, those two medicines are profound. How about the classical psychedelics? What happens when couples go and have joint spiritual experiences? What does that do to them in terms of the strength of their relationship? I think these are really good questions. Um, do you have any concerns that the clinical uh, psychedelic use will overshadow um, recreational uh, psychedelic use? In short, is um, play being um, undercut in, in clinical settings, like play in nature and psychedelics? Um, you know, it's the clinical medical path is the path towards legalization of these medicines. So that's 
that needs to happen in our current framework. That's a clear path forward. Again, like I said when I started, if we just got rid of prohibition, we would skip a lot of that and fast track it, and it would be awesome. Um, I think clinical is very important, and clinical is especially important for people who have you know, very specific traumas, or maybe they're a bit more of a complex case. Uh, I think a clinical setting is awesome. I also think that there's a potential for a, you know, almost like a, an apprenticeship towards psychedelic psychotherapy, almost like a midwifery type of situation where, you know, it doesn't have to be in a clinical setting. It can be using these incredibly safe medicines amongst well-intentioned friends in the therapeutic context. And I think it's also very important to remember the traditional context for these medicines and being able to participate in, you know, beautiful peyote ceremonies in the, in the Native American church context, or even Santo Daime for ayahuasca, or, you know, Shipibo tradition for ayahuasca. That's another way. But I'm a huge proponent of still being able to take <laughs> LSD for fun at a tragic hip concert. <laughs> but I have an awesome story about a hip concert. That I was <laughs> um, so, and that's you know, and I get I get a little I, my back definitely gets up a little bit when I hear people that really want to really be strict with these medicines. I'm like these medicines are also tools of love and fun and, you know, freedom. And mushrooms are great on a sofa, but they're also great with some beers around a campfire with some really good friends. And I've had beautiful transformative experiences that way. So, um, I don't know. I think kids are always going to play, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> Just to offer a counterpoint. <laughs> <laughs> I've been digging through Arrowwood. Do you all know what Arrowwood is? It's a massive online database of knowledge and trip reports. So I've been reading Arrowwood trip reports like crazy recently for a research thing I'm doing. And there's a lot of really horrible stories of what people have done with psychedelics. <laughs> it's obnoxious <laughs> and it's painful to read. So you know, if fun means unsupervised, unskilled, no knowledge, um, unknown dosage, no thoughtfulness to set and setting controls, we have a problem on our hands. We really do. And so we really, as people who are talking about psychedelics, we really need to be talk thoughtful about how we're going to be, we'll become legalized. And my fear is they'll become legalized and then there'll be backlash because we're going to do it really badly. So we have to do it skillfully. And skillful is about supervision and even having training and so people are thoughtfully informed and do it well. And that doesn't mean it's not fun, it just means there has to be some kind of process that brings people into a process so it doesn't go really badly. And if you wanna know what really badly looks like, Google, <laughs> go, in, go into Arrowhead and s search the trip reports using the word schizophrenia. It doesn't look, it's not good, it's really not good. So um, there, there is a counterpoint to what my dear friend has just said. Um, I think I, I agree with Mark with what you're saying, and um, I think also what's important to know is even when we're using things clinically, it's, it's not like a clinical application of it, right? Sure. There's still room in those experiences to have embrace and work with anything that comes up. So it's not like a sterile, you're doing this like strapped to a, a medical bed, right? Like there's the full realm of experience can still be worked with and had within those sessions. And I think one thing I know I've really benefited from is having the mentorship of the Midhofers who um, had experiences and had done work prior to you know, MDMA, LSD becoming illegal. So, you know, getting to bring forward that, that both the knowledge, the respect and the reverence, but also like, and the real knowledge of set setting and context that are going to be helpful bring those through, but also getting to bring that perspective of there is an exploration, there's a play piece that goes alongside 
all of the other, the clinical piece as well, or whatever clinical means, really for us is that we're applying it in a very specific way at a specific time with a, a hope of that will help a specific thing. So yeah, I think there is, we can embrace that piece and I think those of us who are doing the work now really have to hold that, that information, knowledge, teachings from folks who had done some of this work before it became illegal. Uh, I think from a neurofeedback perspective, inspiring spontaneity in clients is something I'm always working towards, and that there's smaller steps that can be taken before the altered state to make it more accessible and make it more likely that you can be kind of present and responsible with yourself and responsible with others and playful and open and enjoying the experience while not just jumping into something that's going to overwhelm me right away. So also creating maybe educational modules about different parts of the brain and what psychedelics are doing in those parts of the brain and what are some different breath methods you can use. Like we already know about holotropic breath work. What are some neurofeedback tools? What are meditation tools? What are dance tools that you can use? And that you understand that these are kind of approximating that. And so in many ways, it's like a pre-training before you get to the full psychedelic experience. So hopefully you're less likely to have that experience where everything falls apart. It might be also another way of preventing that kind of outcome. Yeah, I'm gonna put another shout out for a whole terrific breath work. Yeah. So, um, you know, we're talking a lot about taking, like consuming things yeah. that create non-ordinary states of consciousness. But there's also a very legal way of doing that through breath. And um, I think it's an important lesson we can learn through holotropic breath work. And so if anyone's, is anyone here familiar with holotropic breath work? Okay, so holotropic breath work was developed uh, by Stan and Christina Groff. And so Stan it was one of the pioneers of uh, LSD psychotherapy um, before it became illegal. And then when it became illegal, he switched into doing holotropic breath work. And he has devoted his career to this ever since. And um, some incredible states that people can achieve within doing this breath work. And that is a real opportunity to play and explore. And a huge component is supervision and is whole being in a safe context in which to do that with presence and set setting context. So, I mean, there's other ways of, of doing this work or exploring that are um, also not with ingesting anything. And I think the Max has the Zendo Project, which is uh, an organization that will set up at festivals and concerts and places where people will be taking psychedelics. And everybody at that festival knows that if somebody's having a negative experience on a psychedelic, they can take them to this safe, comfortable place. And you know, I think ideally that is the way you want. You do, you know, you do want some kind of a vessel and something carrying you. It's it's definitely best if we get to a place where nobody in our society is going into an experience like this unconsciously, not knowing some of the potentials that can come up. So say if uh, Dr. Bonner offered each of you $5 million, you could work with anyone you wanted and work with any substance you wanted, what would you, uh, off the top of your head, uh, want to work with and uh, what kind of research would you do? I have the study designed. I would like to do uh, <laughs> Uh, a randomized control trial of the couple's therapy um, for PTSD and then collect a lot of data so that we can just then start doing couples therapy with MDMA. So, but, but the next one would be the randomized control trial. <laughs> I would like to do a randomized control trial adding neurofeedback <laughs> before or after a psychedelic experience and also mapping people. I feel, I just as an EEG individual who likes to reverse engineer things, I think it would be really interesting to have a little more data on that area of things. I've been talking with Sophia about adding EEGs to the microdosing studies because I think that would be really interesting. What could we find from that and how could we enhance the protocols that way? 
So that was the five million dollar question. So I'd like to answer two questions: the five million and the ten million. <laughs> so the five million is LSD for alcoholism because it's such a history to it. We need to bring that particular piece back. So working with LSD um, and starting with alcoholism. But the ten million is, I think, five in the ODMT um, has a remarkable potential for healing. Um, and it's completely different. And, and so really starting to work with the variety of different psychedelics, bringing the LSD back, absolutely. But sort of work with some of the other ones as well. And I'd be, I'd be interested in playing the five in the open one. <laughs> I would use $2 million for that phase one slash phase two FDA approved Ibogaine safety study. And I would use some of it towards, as long as Health Canada gives me approval and I can operate Liberty Root again, I'd like to do an observational study on every single person that comes in. So I think that, I've spoken to Rick about that before, that would cost only about a thousand bucks a head. And yeah, I think 5-MeO-DMT is really neat. I think the single most transformative psychedelic experience of my life is a 5-MeO experience. And I, I love uh, psilocybin. I just I've in the in the last year that I haven't been working with uh, Iboga. Uh, for the record, I have friends who were going to take psilocybin anyway, and I sat for them. And so I've seen a good, you know, twenty or thirty really profoundly transformative experiences with psilocybin. And to go from being an idle game guy where I bring people in for 10 days at a time, have to manage all of that energy, not only their energy, but managing a life of that situation, potentially when I give them medicine, to be able to go in with mushrooms or psilocybin, the you know, technically safest drug on the planet, according to David Nutt's graph, and to be able to have a four to six hour session and see that same kind of radical transformation, I, I'd love to keep doing psilocybin research, especially on healthy normals, like I said. I think us healthy normals need health. <laughs> it's a lot of suffering out there, as you said. <laughs> um, we're going to open the floor for questions, um, but I will ask one more question. Um, since um, Psychedelic seems to be, you know, kind of for the upper class, middle class, white, uh, you know, clinical kind of uh, people. Uh, do you have any ideas about how to increase diversity and to um, include, you know, lower income people into psychedelic therapy? I'm very specifically focused on the downtown east side, as I mentioned, and very specifically have made inroads to, towards working with Native communities directly affiliated or associated or tied to the downtown east side in some way. So that's my own personal steps forward with that. Uh, so a lot of my work, actually prior to starting to do the MDMA work, uh, is with community organizations and uh, aid service organizations. So um, I actually anticipate that probably most of my recruitment for the talking processing therapy would be from those, those organizations, which means we'll be specifically targeting folks who are not able to receive services elsewhere and have strong trauma histories. Um, I also I just want to point out there's a phase three site for um, the Mount Sunbeamy study uh, in University of Connecticut that's specifically, head by Monica Williams, that's specifically targeting um, race-based trauma. And so they are, uh, that is the focus of their recruitment. And so I think that's a really important thing. Anyone else? Right now, mostly I'm focused on private practice. So I always keep a percentage of my practice, about 10% open for pro bono work. Um, and I specifically work with women from a local women's shelter. And I've actually found neurofeedback has been incredibly helpful for these individuals. And it's been uh, really nice to be able to offer that. And I would like to offer more spots with that. So I'm hoping as things move forward and potentially can expand into a clinic, there can be more room for those individuals. So, any questions? Yes. What are you going to do with the partners on the optics problem? A lot of people in the doctor say drugs are bad and they go along with that and they don't feel it over the worst. And there's really a pretty big difference in these things. It's still very pervasive. Uh, and it's hard to think. What do you do about that? Like, being, being with okay, some medicine, you can't take out the problem because you can't buy it. So, how do you address that? Yeah. 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 
So the question was, how do we deal with the optics? And the optics is, it's a drug, and drugs are bad. So I mean, I've spent 30 years in front of audiences talking about the failure of drug prohibition and dealing with a lot of angry people for many, many, many years, essentially dealing with that question. And just being calm, thoughtful, listening, spend a lot of time listening, sharing the evidence, just talk about the science, um, listen some more, share more science, um, share what other countries are doing, share more science, listen, listen, listen. Um, just engage. It's, it's not about being right, it's about engaging in a dialogue. Yeah, I agree with that. And I also think, um, I often use the term medicines when I'm talking about these substances in terms of their use. And so um, I feel like that often like resonates and lands with people a bit more, especially if they understand like, oh, okay, having that conversation, listening to their concerns, their questions, and also going like, you know, we use SSRIs to treat everything, and people are using it for a really long time. And then you, you know, when you talk about the idea that you know people might be using one of these medicines twice, three times, that's it. They don't take it home. And so understanding kind of the the context about it tends to soften people a lot. Um, yeah, I find that's a way that I end up talking about it. And reaching out to soldiers and first responders when we're healing police, it changes the dialogue. I think it's really important to, you know, number one, don't get your back up when somebody, you know, when you sense that, I, I sat in the airport on the way here and I was speaking to somebody, a few past careers that I had came up for some reason and she asked what I do now. I said, actually, I do something fairly unique and we use this plant medicine and it was all good until I said the word psychedelic. <laughs> and then you just saw, and then I just, you know, softened my heart you know, it didn't fight it, and you know, I'm, I'm for everyone. If you're for everyone, who can be against you? So, you know, just be, be what the medicine can turn you into, which is a harmonious being. And, and then, you know, by the end of it, she's like, oh yeah, I'm definitely gonna check out that documentary that you recommended, so, yeah. Be, be the, be the change. I guess I can speak on the opioid crisis in particular, like, what a sham, it's such a racket, you know, get, get, you know, Purdue and Oxycontin is directly responsible for our current, current opioid crisis in a lot of ways, um, you know, and they've, they've now come out with an opiate replacement, you know, so first we'll get you hooked on our pills, then we'll take them away from you, because we can't have you hooked on our pills. But now we're putting on this replacement, which is actually much more toxic than the pills you were taking. So, you know, the methadone 
racket I've seen on the downtown east side. So for, you, for those of you don't, that don't know, if you go to your doctor and say, I'm hooked on heroin, they'll put you on either methadone or suboxone. Both of those are way worse for you than clean heroin is. Like, opiates are basically benign if they're clean. You can use them your whole life and not suffer any true consequences if it's a clean source. But you put people on methadone, and it, you know, teeth fall out, you feel lethargic, uh, it's got problems with the QT interval of the heart. The methadone is way worse for you, it's long lasting, but you know, somebody's making a buck off of every milligram of methadone served. The pharmacies in BC, I just verified this because I, I said it in a movie and the director of the movie wanted to make sure I was right and I found a Globe and Mail article, but Pharmacies for methadone, you have to go and you have to pick up your methadone in person, drink it back in front of them. Each pharmacy makes $6,000 a year per client that does that. So they incentivize that. And methadone doctors incentivize coming to them as methadone doctors, because you have to go see them every two weeks, and that's 150, 200 bucks for them every single visit that our government then pays for. But they're, you know, I've heard, I've heard the worst was, we'll give you a McDonald's gift card if you come get your methadone from us. So how's that for healthcare? So the whole, yeah, the whole profit part, the whole profit motive behind, I think humanity as a whole needs to, if your profit causes human suffering, mm. your profit is, needs to die. <laughs> <laughs> Fear and misinformation is a big thing that keeps what created the war on drugs alive and well now. And um, that's a very minor anecdote around that. For example, you know, psychologists tend to be very interestingly conservative bunch, which is fascinating. Um, but also, you know, pretty measured and conversational. And so when it first started to be known in know my department and with other people that I was starting to do this research I got a lot of like you're a little worried about your career you know or are you like you're not gonna get funded are we gonna do and like just you know there's a quiet naysayer and a quiet um, there was never an outright you shouldn't do that or that's wrong but there was just that fear and the, the fear based insecurity right going like that route is going to be more secure therefore you should go there versus like ooh. What are you going to do? You know, why are you pushing the status quo in that direction? Would you want want to do something a little bit safer at this stage of your career or whatever? So I do think that fear and not wanting to change what is is what keeps it stuck, um, and people being a little bit concerned about that. Uh, yes. I don't know about, like, I know some international, so the question is, are there international organizations that are focusing on moving this agenda forward, like the WHO or something, for example? I don't think the WHO is, but uh, ICERS is an international organization, Inter international something, something, <laughs> ethno-botanical something. <laughs> um, exactly like that. And then there's the Global Ibogaine Therapy Alliance. Um, but I, th I think MAPS is, MAPS is the front runner, I think. And MAPS is international as well. We've got MAPS Canada, MAPS in Israel, elsewhere, I think. Yeah. Are, are any of you members of NTAR? Yeah. Yeah.
heard that name, yeah. yeah. Yeah, May 10th, Michael Winkleman will be coming, and it's myself. Yeah, yeah, we're working together on uh, kind of looking at uh, shamanic practices and plant medicine as therapeutic resource. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Um, Did everyone hear the question? So the question was, does Iboga work for cannabis? So, so, is, is, is cannabis is, reduced in patients when they're on the Iboga treatment or eliminated or added? Uh, no, if somebody uses cannabis, they're already a cannabis user, we'll provide it for them during the treatment. Cannabis oil is an amazing thing, um, like the Phoenix Tears, we can at the end when people are having a hard time sleeping, if somebody, again, again if they're already a cannabis user, we'll go with some, some of those Phoenix tears afterwards. I don't think Ibogaine is the best thing if you want to stop using cannabis. I think ayahuasca is, seems to be the best. That's the thing that kind of broke that cycle for me at a certain stage in my life. After my first time of taking ayahuasca cannabis and I never had the same relationship. But I, it is a great tool, therapeutically. Like, I always feel like we almost said, yeah, cannabis is a medicine. And people are kind of like tongue in cheek, you know, yeah, sure, it's a medicine. All these things are <laughs> but cannabis is literally one of the most powerful medicines you can get your hands on. Like, what it's able to, a state it's able to put people in without the use of an opiate, for example, is phenomenal. Uh, you ready? just trust the medicine too if we just got it in them and if 
eating wrong was one of the things that seriously need to be addressed in that individual, then the medicine is going to tell them that. I need to take it. It's an interesting question. And if I was a researcher and I was being charged with um, writing a protocol for eating disorders, I would ask the question, what would I choose as the medicine? And uh, if I looked at eating disorders and I said the root of eating disorder is trauma, I would choose MDMA. If I looked at eating disorders and I said really it's more a bit like alcoholism, it's an ego rigidity around this behavior that's very, very hard to break, I would consider LSD and psilocybin. So I really think that this, that, that particular one, you could argue it both ways. Well, and that's about all the time we have for our panel, but I would like to thank Trevor, Mark, and Heather. And um, please uh, stay tuned for the closing ceremonies and uh, for the rest from Dan.